the recording will start soon and the recording has started welcome okay let's just take a moment to pray and then we will get going so uh, who, who wants to pray with us together Shri Kumar, why don't you pray? We get started, please. Yes, Pastor. Our loving Father, we thank you and praise you for this wonderful day. Lord, Master, we bless your holy name. And Father, we thank you for your divine grace and for your divine love, hmm. which is flowing in each one of our life, God, Master. Hmm. Father, we pray that, Father, strengthen your servant, Lord, Master, anoint his tank, in such a way, Father, of every word which is going to come out from his mouth, let it be filled with the deep revelation and wisdom and Lord and Master and divine understanding and prepare each one of our hearts so that we, we can able to receive it. Lord, Master, hold on that revelation and let me deeply rooted in that revelation so that we can be a mighty testimony, a powerful vessel for your kingdom so that, Father, wherever we go, let your, let, your, let your kingdom manifest through our life. Let your kingdom manifest through our ministry. Let mm. signs, wonders, miracles happen, O oh God. Let we never do the ministry in the natural understanding. Let we do the ministry in the spiritual and godly understanding, O oh God. Bless each one of us with your divine wisdom and revelation. We humble ourselves, O oh God. Lord, remove every doubts from our heart. Strengthen each one of us. All the glory, honor, and praises belongs to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. All right, so welcome to this class on Keys to Supernatural Ministry. Um, last week, we uh, attempted or we just started off on key number five. Just to quickly review, uh, we are in um, section two, where we're talking about uh, these eight keys that I want to talk about um, for supernatural life and ministry covering these eight keys then we're going to talk about personal preparation how do we prepare ourselves and then we talk about continuing uh, the section four we'll talk about continuing in the pursuit uh, of the supernatural so in doing these eight keys we talked about key number one understand the realm of the spirit key number two is faith key number three is the power of the word key number four is the renewed mind and we were talking about the anointing of the Holy Spirit, key number five. So uh, the miracles, the supernatural takes place because of the anointing, which is uh, when we say the anointing, it's simply the presence. Uh, Charles, uh, your question is, was the key uploaded? No, it's still locked. Uh, we will upload it. <laughs> I will upload the document right just we'll have to type it out i have my outline with me but i will uh, expand that and share it with you so uh key number five the anointing of the holy spirit so what we're saying is miracles happen the supernatural happens because of the anointing and the anointing simply is the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit expressed through the life of the believer. And uh, last week, we were just trying to establish a little difference between the indwelling presence and the presence upon or the anointing upon. Uh, we have seen already that, uh, you know, you've, you've learned in your Holy Spirit class that when Jesus ministered, he ministered under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is upon him to empower him to minister, right, to do the work he did. So today, uh, in, in talking about the anointing, I want to just kind of zero in. We could talk about the anointing a whole lot. We could probably do an entire course on uh, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But I want to zero in on certain things that you and I uh, need to understand to see the supernatural released through us because or by the anointing. Right. So the anointing, we said, is the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit released through us to cause a work of God to take place. You know, whether it's a healing, whether it's a deliverance, whatever, whatever the need of the people is, you know, the work of God will take place. The anointing is released. Some important things to understand about the anointing. 
Uh, Charles, I will share this document afterwards, okay? First is the anointing flows normally, normally. The anointing flows through us, aligned to the gift and the grace God has placed on us. Okay, so understand. The anointing, that is the work and the ministry, the power of the Holy Spirit, is released through each one of us, aligned to the gift and the grace God has placed in us. So you can think about God's grace on your life and God's gifting on your life as conduit or a channel through which the anointing is going to be expressed or released. Okay, normally. Now, so what, what do you mean by that? Yeah, you know, so we have so many different people here on the on the call. Each one of us, God has graced each one of us and gifted each one of us differently. Right. So, example, let's say if somebody here is uh, called graced and gifted by God in the area of worship or music that's your the grace and the gift of god on your life is a conduit through which the anointing is going to be expressed why because god put that grace and god gave you that gift and for that matter each one of us has been given grace and gift and we can establish that from scripture that everyone has been given grace, has been given gift or gifts by God. Right? So we're talking about the grace and the gift that's specific to our lives. Now, for instance, the gifts of the Spirit are available for all of us. Right? All the nine gifts are available to all of us. And so that also becomes a conduit of the expression of the anointing. I'm not talking about the gifts of the Spirit. I'm talking about the grace and the gift that God has placed on each one of us. Whatever it is, whatever that grace gift. So, you can intentionally step in to the grace and the gift that's on your life. You can intentionally step into it. You know, you don't need to pray in God, should I do this or not? No. It's a grace on your life. It's always there. It's a gifting on your life. It's always there. You can step into that grace and gift anytime, any place. And when you step into that grace and the gift, what happens? The anointing will begin to flow through that grace and gift. Okay, there are several things that I want us to talk about. So I'm just touching on these one by one. So the first thing is this. The anointing is expressed through the grace and the gift God has placed on your life. Uh, or I should Let's use it in plural, right? graces and gifts because many times God has given us more than one grace one area of grace and more than one gift so when you step into your grace and your gift it is something you can do what happens the anointing will begin to flow so let me just give you a scripture on this, Ephesians chapter 3. All right, so let's try to understand these things so that, you know, we will learn how to release and minister uh, the anointing to people. So we know, we don't question the power of the anointing. We know it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. We know it's the anointing that will cause healing and deliverance, whatever the work of God. So we are learning, okay, how do I, you know, make myself available to the anointing so that the anointing of God, which is the work of the Holy Spirit can flow through my life. Here's one key, or here's one important key. It's the grace and gift. So let's go uh, Ephesians chapter three and uh, verse seven, please. Somebody could read that. Yes, Pastor. Ephesians three verse seven says, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. Amen. 
you know, Paul is talking about his own life and ministry. And uh, sorry, this is Ephesians 3 7. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Paul said he's talking about his own ministry. He says, I became minister. He just he became a, he became a minister of the gospel. But how was he ministering? According to the gift of grace. Gift of grace of God, which was given to him. So God gave him the gift and the grace. So God has given each one of us gifts, graces. I'm using it in plural because, you know, usually it's more than one in all of our lives. But the gift and the grace is made effective by how? The working of his power. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. That is the flow of the power of the Holy Spirit. So for all of us, I want to encourage you, first simple thing, to express the anointing, manifest it. Flow in your areas of gift and grace. Just a step into it. So that part is what is the human part. It's what you can do, and you can do it anytime. Right? So example, if, uh, if you're a teacher, if you are, you know, whether you're whatever, teaching, whether you're teaching the Bible, you're teaching something else, you know, um, that's your gift. If you are a, you know, if you can help people, you serve people in compassion, that's, that's an area. You're ministering to people's service. That's an area. So, or you are, you know, so God has called you to be generous. So generosity is a certain thing that's working in your life. That's an area. But through your area of gift and grace, as you just intentionally step into it, there's going to be the effective working of his power. There's going to be the flow of the anointing of the Holy Spirit aligned to the gift and the grace of God in your life. And every time you step in intentionally into your gift and grace, because God gave it to you, and you step in to serve people, you step in to minister to people with that gift and grace, there will be the flow of His power through your life. Now, just a corollary or a flip side is this, that we shouldn't necessarily try to step into a grace or a gift that is not given to us. You know, I mean, there may be occasions, God, again, because God's a supernatural God, he's not limited. Sometimes he'll enable you to step into something uh, uh, that is not there. But that's, you know, that is God's prerogative. That means he would move you in something like that temporarily. But normally, don't try to, to imitate somebody else's gift and grace because there will not be the effective working of his power. You move in your gift and grace because God has uniquely gifted and graced all of us. So you need to know, this is my gift and grace. I can move on it and I know the power of God will flow. There will be the effective working of his power. And I see Sri Kumar's question. The answer to that is yes. We can grow in our gift and we can grow in our grace. And as you grow, so that brings us to a related truth. As you grow in your gift and as you grow in your grace, you will also grow in your anointing. So people ask, right, how can I grow in the anointing? Well, this is one key. You grow in your grace you grow in your gift you will grow in the anointing so you can imagine uh, this is just pictorial right you can imagine that your grace and gift is the conduit the channel so let's say when we start out we are usually you know the conduit is narrow and small we're just understanding our grace and our gift and so there's a certain measure of anointing flowing but as you, as you grow in your grace and you grow in your gifting, you can imagine that the conduit is becoming bigger. So there's a more greater release 
of the anointing through your gift and grace right so again scriptures on that uh, ephesians chapter 4 uh, verse 7 talks about the measure uh, well, let me type this out ephesians 4 7 oh, i felt it wrong anyway Ephesians 4, 7 talks about the measure of Christ's gift. That means there are different measures of the same gift, right? There is grace and gift given to us. There are different measures of grace and gift on our lives. and We can grow in grace. You know, the Bible talks about 2 Peter 3, 18, grow in grace. Um, James says, but there is more grace available, right? And let me give you, so we said, um, 2 Peter 3.18, grow in grace, so you can increase in grace. And um, James 4 and verse 6, he gives more grace. So there is more grace available. Okay. I'm just typing these scriptures out. Yeah. So Ephesians 4 7 talks about the measure of the gift. So there are different measures of the gift. You can grow, increase in the measure of your gift. You can also increase in grace. There is more grace available. Right? So a simple way to grow in grace and the gift is to use it. So the more you exercise the gift or the gifts, and the more you exercise the grace God has put on your life, you're going to grow in that grace and you're going to grow in that gift. And there will be an increased measure of anointing. Increased measure of the expressions of that anointing through our, our lives. Okay, so first truth about first truth about the anointing that we want to understand is this: the anointing flows aligned to the gift and the grace of God on our lives. We can step into that gift and grace intentionally at any time, any place. And as you begin to step in and act on that, work or move in that grace and gift on your life, you can expect the anointing to flow. You can grow in your area of gift and grace. And you grow in your aid and gift and grace by just using and exercising more and more. And as you do it, you'll find greater measures of God's anointing being released through your life. Okay. Now, the second key to the anointing is this. The anointing always accompanies the word. The anointing always accompanies the word or you could say this the anointing and the word are inseparable right the anointing and the word of god are inseparable or the word is anointed by the spirit and and, and you find many scriptures in this you know in john 6 and 63 jesus said the words i speak to you they are spirit and they are life. So he's saying, the words I speak to you. Jesus is saying, the words I speak to you. They are spirit, or they are actually bringing in the Holy Spirit. So the anointing and the word are inseparable. That's the second truth that we must understand in relation to the anointing. The anointing and the word are inseparable. And what does that mean? How do we practice it? It means this, that when we open our lives to the word of God, to more of the word, we are positioning ourselves to more of the anointing. When we act on the word, the anointing will be expressed. 
So the word and the anointing are inseparable. So first we talked about the anointing, gift and grace. First thing. Second, we're talking about the anointing and the word. So this is accessible for all of us. The first one, which we mentioned, is, is, you, is, is accessible to all of us, but it's different for all of us because it's different. There's a different, different areas of grace and anointing and you flow in whatever God has given you. The second one is accessible for all of us and it's the same. It's the word. We're talking about the written word, okay. So the written word is accessible for all of us. And the anointing of the word are inseparable. And so when you and I devote ourselves to more of the word, we are opening ourselves to more of the anointing. When you and I act on the word, we are opening ourselves to the flow of the anointing. Okay, it's a very simple truth. But we must understand that. So when you act on the word, you can expect the release of the anointing, the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says the spirit and the word are in agreement. You know, First John 5 and verse 7. The spirit and the word are in agreement. So whenever you're acting on the word, you are positioning yourself for a release of the anointing. So in this second truth that we are sharing, how can we increase in the anointing? By increasing in our engagement with the word. Now, I have to qualify that because when I say engagement with the word, it's not just about uh, 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 an intellectual study of the word. Right, because there are people who might, you know, engage with the Bible from an intellectual perspective, you know, or a literary perspective. Okay, I want to know what this book is and, uh, you know, from that. But they're not actually engaging with the spirit and the life of the word. They are engaging with the letter of the word, with the, maybe with the, the you know, the, the literary style of the word or the historical information in the word or uh, the subject matter of the word or whatever you know so but when you and i engage with the word the spirit and the life of the word we are opening ourselves to the holy spirit the anointing and then when we act on that word when you say holy spirit you know so this is again available to all of us whatever that word is when you act on it the Holy Spirit is there. The anointing will flow when you act on that word that you have engaged with um, in the spirit and the life of that word. Okay, so this is why the second, in, in the second aspect, this is why it's important for you and me to just meditate in the word. So, if we want, so I'm, and I'm, I'm getting practical now, okay? If we want to see example, the prophetic, more of the prophetic flowing through us, engage with the prophetic scriptures. You know, you read the scriptures that talk about God speaking to man and through man. You read about the prophetic experiences of, you know, people in the Bible, the Old Testament, New Testament. You just meditate in it. You know, you go to those things, those passages, and you meditate in those passages. If you want to grow in the healing, you meditate in the healing miracles in the Bible. If you want to grow in the other kinds of miracles, you know, the miracles that affect nature, the miracles that affect situations, circumstances, finances, what do you do? You engage, you meditate in the word on those miracles because the anointing and the word go together. 
And as you soak in the spirit and the life of those, of that word, you and I, we are making ourselves, or we are positioning ourselves to be conduits of the anointing to cause that word to take place when we act on that word. So did we understand these two points? The first one is the anointing flows through the gift and the grace God's put on us. Second, the anointing accompanies the word. But I'm just talking about the practical, how do you apply it? Is that, is that, un, did we all understand it? Okay, Charles, your question, please. Uh, uh, kindly, Pastor, uh, repeat or shed more light on the practical part, the one that we have just concluded, so mm -hmm. that we, okay. we, you know, these things are, are big and deep, so <laughs> sometimes it takes us time to to digest. Thank you. Yeah, I will do that. Shrikama, what was your question? Thank you, Pastor. Pastor, um, uh, I, this, this is related to the gifts only. I just want to know that um, uh, when uh, when we when we as you said about um, meditate if you want to sharpen the gift of the prophetic to so, um, meditate on the you know prophetic scriptures I just want to know that um, um, how, is it also uh, when you meditate on this um, can <clears throat> can we also sharpen the sharpen the gifts of visions when we when we meditate on the the gift of prophetic uh, the, why 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 i'm asking you this because uh, sometimes when i pray my visions are very clear sometimes it is blurred so i i always have a confusion that uh, why this is happening like sometimes why it is uh, very blurred and, and and i'm not able to uh, see it i i have to uh, try to understand what is what i'm seeing but sometimes it is very clear. So I just want, I am always in a doubt that why it is happening. So I just thought, okay, I will put across this question when we are discussing on the spiritual gifts. Thank you, Pastor. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the answer to your question is yes. Right? That when you and I are engaging with the word, that's meditating, I can I'll use the word meditate or engage with the word on the prophetic and like what we're seeing in the scriptures on the prophetic it's going to sharpen our prophetic faculties that means the ability for ability for our, our abilities to see hear and feel the holy spirit right so remember in 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 the prophetic uh, our ability uh, our spiritual faculties, the faculties of our spirit are important. The faculties of our spirit to see, hear, and feel. Because the Holy Spirit is communicating through those faculties. So as we uh, spend time in the Word, our ability to see, hear, and feel is sharpened. Now, let me put it like this, okay? Uh, I'll give you a simple example. Uh, let's see if this helps. I'll give you now. I'm 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 typing a formula, but don't think I am. Uh, uh, I'm 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 reducing God to a formula. That's not what I, uh, I I intend. But I'm just doing this to explain. Okay. So revelation depends on two things: perception and illumination. That's when we receive revelation. That means we are seeing something we otherwise don't see. Perception is our ability to see. Illumination is what the Holy Spirit gives, the light He gives. Okay, so now think about two scenarios. If my perception is zero, but I come into a room where it's fully illuminated. 
but my perception is zero. There will be no revelation. Not because there is no illumination, the Holy Spirit is giving their illumination, but my perception, my ability to see is zero. So I still say, oh, God is not revealing anything to me. Now, when I say perception, remember, you know, it's more than sight. You know, we see, hear, and feel. So all of that is perception. I'm just using sight as an example. But on the other hand, if my perception is sharp, that means I can see and feel. But we will have revelation only when there is illumination, only when the Holy Spirit is showing something, shedding light. So if the Holy Spirit is not showing anything, okay, there won't be any revelation, even if my perception is sharp. But if my perception is sharp and the Holy Spirit is showing something, we will have revelation. Engaging with the word sharpens our perception, our ability to see, hear, and feel. Right? Uh, Hebrews 5 says, you know, as we engage with the word, our senses are exercised to discern good and evil. So as we feed ourselves with the word, we've been nourished ourselves with the word. So again, I, I want to say it's not just an intellectual pursuit of the word, but it's engaging with the spirit and life of the word. What happens? Our senses are exercised to discern. That means our perception is increased. Or uh, if you want to, uh, I think I'm getting a little off track, but I'll just, you know, just get, get our attention to this. Uh, if you go with me to John chapter 8, and we look at verse 43 and 47, It's very interesting. Jesus says here, John 8, 43, Jesus is telling these Pharisees, Jews, why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. Okay. And then he says the word, verse 47, he who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. Now, what is he saying? He's saying, look, of, of course, of course, they were hearing him in the natural, right? They were having conversation. They're talking. So naturally, in the natural, they are hearing his words. But they are missing something. Verse 43, they're not understanding. Verse 47, they are not hearing God. They are listening to his words. Of course, you know, he's having conversation with the Jews. They're talking. But they're not able to uh, understand. That means get the meaning of what he's saying, and they're not hearing God. Why? Because of that lack of spiritual perception. Right? They're not connected in the spiritual. So when we spend time in the word, our ability to connect in the spiritual increases, and therefore it increases the prophetic expressions or revelation that comes. Is it okay? Yes, sir. Thank you. Sir. Okay. All right. So going back to what Charles requested. Um, so the anointing and the word go together. They flow together. 
So the more we engage with the spirit and the life of the word, the more we are positioning ourselves to be channels or conduits of the anointing. And then we act on that word, the anointing will be released. So what do we do? We spend, we engage with the word as we meditate, we engage with the spirit and life of the word. And what I was saying was, you engage with the healing miracles in the Bible, Old and New Testament. You engage with the prophetic, Old and New Testament. You engage with other miracles, Old and New Testament. You, you meditate on it. You receive the spirit and life of those scriptures. So we're not just, you know, like we said here, in the, when Jesus being the Jews, you're not just listening, you're not just looking at the word, but you're wanting to understand, you're wanting to hear God through that word. Right, that means spiritually you're engaging. You meditate in it. And that prepares you and me to express the anointing that comes through that word. So more of the prophetic, or more of the healing, or more of the miracles will be expressed through us as we engage with the word in that manner. Okay, so you just take time to meditate, to engage with the word, because you know that the anointing of the word flow together. Okay, so that's the second way for us to grow, uh, to express and to grow in the anointing in our lives. Okay. Then there is also the aspect of consecration. We will talk about it in personal preparation, right? In how when we in the next section we talk about personal preparation. That the anointing is related to consecration before God. Right? And you can look at it from various angles or various uh, ways, various ways. One is the typical way to look at it as a vessel, right? As a vessel. So the more empty the vessel is, the more full it can be of God, right? The more empty I am of myself, the more full I can be of God. That's consecration, right? So the third practical thing to be a conduit of the anointing is consecration. I'll just mention it here. We'll deal with the consecration more in the third section when we talk about personal preparation for the supernatural. So the anointing is the expression of the power of the Holy Spirit. It flows aligned to the gift and grace in our lives. It flows to the degree of the word of God in our lives. As we engage with the word, you will have more expression of the anointing. And so we intentionally go and spend more time in the word. Sometimes we're too busy, then you know you will see the, the expressions diminish. But the times you spend more time in that word, and there will be more expressions of the anointing. Some other the other things that I want to talk about is this: that uh, there are different measures of the anointing. That means uh, we can increase in the level of anointing flowing through our lives. There are times you'll find that hmm, the anointing is flowing, but it's not at the same level as maybe at other times when you know we've done a little bit more of preparation, uh, we've done, spent a little bit more time in prayer and so on, uh, uh, and there's a greater flow of the anointing. The degree of the anointing that is expressed depends both on the person ministering but also on the expectation of the people if the people are expecting are expectant you'll have a greater expression of the anointing 
right? So the same. So if you if you have two situations where you've done the same amount of preparation, but in one situation, people are not very expectant. They just okay, come on, let's get get done with the service. We'll go, or you get done with your prayer. I'll go. But you're in another situation, the same preparation, but the people are expectant. They want. When I say people, it could be an individual, it could be a congregation, doesn't matter. But the people are pulling on God, are pulling on. The expectation is more. What will happen? You've done the same preparation, but the manifestation of the anointing will be greater that the expectation level is greater. So what must we do? We must encourage the expectation of people. But we have to do it without hype and fancy. You know, nowadays, sometimes there's too much of hype. Uh, people unnecessarily stir up the emotions of people and say, oh, you know, and I'll make all kinds of statements. Uh, the intent is, let's raise their expectation. But sometimes in an, in an effort to do that, it ends up in, you know, a, a place that is not nice. So we have to balance, we have to be careful. You know, encourage people, but don't hype things up. Because we do understand, we do know that expectation plays, the expectation of the individual or the people plays a big part in the expression of the anointing. The more expectant people are, the more of the anointing that will flow to, to, towards people. Okay, so we encourage their expectations. So, you know, uh, Believe God that he will do things today. You, know, you minister the word to build up faith. You do it in a proper way. Don't do it in a hyped, hyped up way. And don't do it in a way that is focused on the individual. Do it in a way that is focused on Jesus Christ. Because the individual can change. Today it can be you. Tomorrow it can be somebody else. The day after tomorrow it could be another person. The individual can change. But if the faith of the people is in Jesus and in what he is able to do, then they will expect regardless of the individual. But expectation is important in the activation of the anointing. So there are different measures of the anointing. The measure of anointing that's demonstrated depends both on the preparation and the expectation of the people, both in this. Okay? So how do we grow in the anointing? We grow through our preparation. That is, we continue to exercise the, the gift and the grace, we continue to engage with God through his word, we continue to increase in our levels of consecration before God, and so we can grow in the anointing. Okay. Now, related to the anointing is this whole aspect of the impartation of the anointing. That means we do our preparation, we encourage expectation, But there's also this aspect or the element of impartation. What is impartation? It means God transferring into your life something that he has placed on somebody else, right? And there are so many things that, you know, uh, I say so many things, but there are truths that we need to understand about impartation. Impartation is not an arbitrary thing. That means, you know, we can't just randomly lay hands on people and say, take a double measure of my anointing or this and that. It doesn't happen like that. If that was the case, you know, if we could all lay hands on each other and keep multiplying exponentially the anointing in our lives, you know, uh, it's not like that. A few things about impartation. Usually, the impartation is also aligned to the gift and grace that's in your life. Usually. I say usually because there are times we can never put God in a box. There are times God will do something unusual and unexpected. But the norm is 
the impartation of the anointing is also aligned to the gift and grace that's on your life, the gift and calling on your life. So, if there is somebody who is anointed as a worship leader, you are not called to be a worship leader. There's no point in going to that person and saying, pray for me that I'll get a worship, or not, worship leader anointing. It's not going to work. At most, it will be like Saul's experience. You know, in the Old Testament, uh, in, uh, in, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 10, we read about King Saul. I mean, he was not king at that time. But he went to meet Samuel. Now, Saul was not a prophet. He was going to be anointed king. He was not a prophet. He went to meet Samuel looking for his donkeys. Samuel said, look, you know, your, your, father, your donkeys have already been, your father's donkeys have already been found. Go home. On the way, you'll meet a group of the prophets and the spirit of them will come on you. So it records that, that Saul, on his way, he met a group of the prophets. They were prophets. He was not. But when he came into them, the company, he began to prophesy. He became changed into another man. So people thought Saul also had become a prophet, but it was only a temporary thing. He came under the influence of the prophetic anointing at that moment, and he prophesied. He was changed into another man, but it was a temporary thing because you don't find him being a prophet the rest of his life. Why? He was not called to be a prophet. That was not the grace on his life. He was going to be anointed king. Just an example. So impartation is also normally aligned to the gift and the call on grace of God on your life. Second, impartation normally takes place through association. That means as you engage with, with another minister of God who has a certain grace and a gift and anointing, impartation takes place. There will be the rare occasions when somebody random, you know, uh, you may meet somebody for five minutes and they lay hands on you and something is imparted to you. God can do that and he does that. But that's not the norm. The norm is when you associate, when you engage, you receive. That's what we see in the life of Moses and Joshua and the others. That's what we see in the case of Elijah and Elisha. There was association, right? Uh, that means they engaged with them. And, it, you know, of course you can engage even from a distance or whatever, but th there was that kind of an association which then caused the anointing to be transferred. Um, the other thing you must keep under and understand, understand uh, impartation is usually impartation happens in a measure. There are times there is a double measure, but usually it's a measure. It's a certain aspect of the anointing that's imparted. So we saw this last time. There's a certain aspect of Moses' anointing that's, that was given to the 70. Moses was prophet and miracle worker and all of that. But when the anointing was transferred to the 70 leaders, it was the wisdom that was given to them so that they could also govern. They didn't become prophets. They didn't become miracle workers. Same thing with Joshua. It says the spirit of wisdom was given to Joshua. That means a certain aspect of Moses' anointing was transferred to Joshua. It wasn't everything. Joshua did not become a copy of Moses, but he walked in the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. So usually in the transfer of anointing, there's a certain aspect that is transferred. There may be times when a full measure or a double measure is transferred, but the norm is a certain aspect is transferred. So is transfer of anointing real? Yes, it is. But we must understand how the, the, the dynamics of transfer of anointing. Right? But that does enhance our lives. That does enhance our lives. And last point I want to say as far as the anointing comes, ultimately everything we receive comes from God, not the individual. God may use an individual to bring about an impartation, but that anointing doesn't come from the individual. It comes from God. Because a man can receive nothing unless it is given to him from God. And everything that is received, even through transfer, has to be developed. 
Paul told Timothy, stir up the gift of God that is in you, which was given to you through the laying on of hands. That means even though something was given, it was neglected. It had to be developed. So impartation is not an automatic step into a higher realm. It's something that God has placed in the body, but we must understand the dynamics that is involved. Ultimately, it comes back to the same thing. It comes back to God working in our lives, aligned to his gift and grace, the anointing flowing through our lives, aligned to our engagement with his word, right? And the anointing being expressed in response to the expectation of people, in response to our preparation and people's expectation, the anointing will flow. Okay, so I've tried to condense like maybe 40 hours of teaching on the anointing into like these quick, quick nuggets. Uh, I hope you've kind of got all of that and uh, you, will, you will take it and you will feed on it. Uh, but this is an important part of how the anointing flows through our lives so that the work of God can take place. Okay, so what we want to do lastly, which we'll pick up, we'll spend one more session is a little bit more time is uh, administering the anointing. Okay, that means the anointing is flowing how do I help people receive the anointing? How do I administer it so that a miracle can take place? And I've, uh, this, uh, in that process, we must also understand the roadblocks, the hindrances that keep people from receiving the anointing. We'll touch on that next week. And uh, I will share with you the notes, the points of, uh, on the anointing, and then we'll move forward. Any questions before we wrap up? Was it clear? Uh, did you all understand? Okay. Okay. Some of you responded. Okay, I see your thoughts, comments there. Harrison, you have a question before we go? Go ahead, please. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, I'm just looking at, I'm, I'm kind of looking at the aspect of gifting. And, you know, there's some times, you know, where you like, you know, find yourself, you know, doing what you do. And it's more like, you know, that's your gifting. But at the end of the day, that's not the gifting. And you begin to wonder, okay, who am I really? So my question is, okay, in such situations, you know, where you battle, you know, with your gifting, or maybe trying to battle, you know, with identifying your gifting, what are possible ways, you know, you could advise, you know, for one to be able to pay attention in identifying that gifting? Mm. How do we... What are some of the possible ways in which you can identify your gift? Um, two things that come to mind. One is there's a grace in that area. Okay, like we said, Grace, gift, and power, they're all, they all flow together. And ideally, we have to have them all aligned. Grace, gift, and power. So gift is the ability. And grace is God's, you know, uh, empowering in that sense. And then, of course, there's the anointing that flows through it. It's God's working through the grace and gift. So, for example, in my own life, in my early days, I was never a person who would stand up and speak in front of people. I would, that was not, I was not, I, I, by nature, I'm not an extrovert. 
I'm not a person who would go and talk and you know to that. I'm just a quiet person. If you leave me alone, I'll just quietly do my thing. I was not the person to stand up in front of people and talk. Uh, that's not. That was never a quote unquote gift in my life. Never. But suddenly, you know, uh, when I after I got saved and got filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, it just happened. I just had the not only the courage. I just had the courage to stand in front of people and start talking, whether it's an individual or in front of my classroom, in front of my school. Uh, just you know, I, there was no fear. There was no, you know, any nothing like that. Now, till that time, I was not the person who would stand up in front of anybody and talk. But something changed. And so, how did I recognize that gift? Because there was grace to do it. So I would say, you know, is there a grace in that area? Second, I would say is look for the fruit. Right? So grace, and then there's a fruit. That means... Okay, you, you you do something, you know. You try out. You're trying out some something. Uh, is there a grace, the enabling, to do it? Secondly, is there fruit coming out of it? And are our lives impacted positively? Uh, are lives being touched positively? You know. Then you know. Okay, this is something God's. God is at work in this area. So, but if I'm tr trying to do something and it's such a big struggle, then there is no grace. And if I'm trying to do something and, you know, it doesn't impact people, there is no fruit. Then I would start to question, you know, maybe there is no gift in this area. Is that okay, Harrison? Did I help in some way? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions before we go? All right, so we have a few more things on anointing we'll cover next week, and then we'll move forward with the other aspects, okay? Uh, let's just close in prayer. And we will dismiss. Could somebody pray with us as a class and dismiss us? Can I pray? Go ahead, Harrison. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you and we bless your name. I, I come before your throne. I come before your throne of grace. And I come before your people, and I come before your pastor, your servant, whom you've used to speak to us this morning, this afternoon, this evening, to say, Father, we're grateful. We're, we're thankful for, for your revelation. We're thankful for revealing Jesus to us because this is the best thing that can ever happen to us. This is the best thing that can ever happen to our lives. So, dear Father, we pray, Lord, that we shall not just be hearers of your word, but mm. we shall also be doers of your word. We pray that, Father, you will give us the grace of God to live according to our giftings, mm. to live according to the grace that you have bestowed on us. We pray, Father, that you will help us, O God, not to live this life, O God, pursuing what you have not designed us for. Mm. We pray, Father, that you will help us, O God, to see you just as you are, to walk in the grace that you have bestowed us on and that the fruit of God of, of us being in this world will be fulfilled and seen in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Father, that the word that we've heard today shall not just drop, drop to, to, to the floor or drop to the crown, but, Father, we will take up of God this knowledge, you know, we'll take up of God this experience, we'll take up of God this revelation and begin to do great and mighty things as we see your kingdom expand and your territory of God ever going towards you know all nations and tribes we thank you heavenly father because we know that 
you're raising a God army for yourself. Mm -hmm. And we thank you because we know that at the end we shall all make heaven. Blessed be your holy name. For in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. God bless you all. Have a good uh, rest of the day. And uh, I'll see you again soon. Bye now. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Harrison. Thank you, everybody.